Welcome back. Well, since we've been talking about kitchen appliances, ranges, and refrigerators, I thought we would stick with the theme and take a look at some small appliances. And the reason for this is that when you put together a vintage or antique room, it's very easy to get the big stuff right. But, you know, sometimes your design can just stand or fall on the little things. And in this case, I want to show you some irons because those of you who are looking at reproducing a nice vintage kitchen are probably going to want to take a look at what the technology was like in the era that you're shooting for. For the rest of you, which is to say those of us who are not putting together vintage kitchens, I'm hoping it'll just be fun and educational. So, when we come back, When I started researching clothes ironing, I was very surprised to find that this has been going on for literally thousands of years. I had no idea. I rather pictured medieval people walking around with dirty wrinkled clothes, but apparently that was not the case. Now, the image that you're looking at right now is two Korean women, and they are ironing fabric in a way that was traditionally used in Asia for at least 2,000 years. What they would do is grab a piece of fabric, and you would need at least two people to do it. They would hold the fabric taut, and run a pan of hot coals over the fabric. Now, from the looks of this illustration, I suspect the fabric was wet when they did it. That would be more effective that way, frankly, but this is how it was done in Asia. So let's take a look at Europe. This is a piece of shaped glass. This particular piece is from Wales, so this is a little Welsh ironing device. Uh, pieces like this were used in Scandinavia and in Western Europe. They would take a, a smooth stone, or in this case, a specifically formed piece of glass, which was more effective and a more valuable item. Pieces like this were found in the grave goods of Viking women. So this is something that was considered a prized possession. Again, you would pull the fabric taut and then you would just grab this by the handle and literally press the wrinkles out of the fabric. Now, obviously, this is where we get the term pressing from. The fact that very soon we're going to be using iron implements tells us where we got the term ironing from. But this shows you how far back it goes. This is a linen press. Now, there is also another item called a linen press, which is a cabinet in which one kept the linen. I suspect the history of these two pieces is somehow related because this linen press has drawers in it and it may well be that the original linen press was a device to press the linen and then later because of the storage drawers it became associated with a place to store the already pressed linen but again speculation 
the way this piece worked was uh, the same way a book press works. And that actually looks a lot like a book press. You lay your linen fabric down on a table, a piece of weighted wood drops down on it, and then you have this screw device so you can tighten it and force out all the wrinkles. You can probably force out all the water, so I imagine you could do that with a piece of damp fabric. Again, pressing damp fabric is more effective than pressing dry fabric. But this is the sort of thing that would have been used in a very large medieval household. This, this would be in the king's household or the duke's household. It was not going to be in the household of just a random country squire. This is a Scandinavian piece. This is called a mangle board. I do love that name. And the way one used a piece like this is, as you can see, it has a handle. And you would just sort of rub it across the fabric. The fabric would be stretched, sometimes between rollers, sometimes, as in the illustration of those two Korean laundresses, it might just be two people holding it taut. Uh, very decorative, very early piece. This is a mangle. Now, most of you will be somewhat familiar with this design from the old ringer washers. Well, in this case, it wasn't intended to get the water out of the fabric. You would push the fabric through and turn that large crank and it would force the wrinkles out of the fabric. I did want to show you something because obviously that is old. Take a look at this one. This is a modern mangle. These items clearly are still in use. This one is, uh, that picture is from Sweden, and it's from, I believe, a hospital laundry. So people are still using that technology to press clothing today, although obviously it's been upgraded. This is the home iron. Now, this is an old iron. Uh, it's just a, a, literally a piece of iron. And this is often what we call a sad iron. The reason we call them sad irons is because they were very heavy and it was a real pain in the butt to iron your clothes with something like this. You had to make sure that the iron was clean Oh, by the way, you needed two of them so that while you were using one to iron with, the other was heating. You had to make sure that the sole plate, that's the bottom of the iron, the part that comes in contact with the clothing, that had to be perfectly clean, it had to be smooth, and it had to be waxed. You needed uh, some sort of pot holder, if you will. Usually it was nothing more than a piece of cloth to wrap around that handle because the entire iron got hot. If you put that on a coal fire or into a fireplace, that handle was going to get hot. You would burn yourself on this. I can understand why it was called a sad iron. This is another early type of iron and this one held hot coals. Now, let me show you another picture of this iron. It's not the same iron, of course, but this is how it works. We have the iron on the left ready for use. And on the right, you can see the iron opened up so that you would fill it with hot coals and then use that to do your ironing. It was something of an improvement over the sad iron, but not much. And here we have a picture of a woman using uh, what may well be one of those cold irons. Um, the box at the bottom seems a little large, pressing clothing. And as you can see from the, the drawing, we are looking at an 18th century woman.
there were some innovations in ironing. This is a design that was developed by a 19-year-old housewife from Iowa. Her name was Mary Potts. And Mary Potts came up with a couple of notions. Uh, one was irons should have wooden handles. Two, irons should have a point on both ends, front and back. And let me show you the third. The wooden handle should be removable so that you only have to heat the bottom of the iron and you just sort of take the handle with you, pop it on the next. Remember, one's heating while you're using one. So one cools off, you drop it in the fire, grab the one that's been heating. You've got a handle which has not been in the fire, which is a very good idea, no matter how you slice it. And then you just go back to your ironing. So thank you, Mary Potts. This style of iron is the iron that we tend to see most often. Again, it's a sad iron. It was heated on a fire uh, or on a stove, and you just muscled your way through the wrinkles. These are so common because from about, oh, 1830 or so, uh, right up until people got electricity in their homes, this was the iron they were using. Mary Potts, by the way, did her inventing in the 1870s. This is an early electric iron. And one of the things I want you to notice about this, because here we have another. Here's the old sad iron. Here's the new electric iron. Very little has changed. They still look very much alike. It's just that one has a plug going into it. So, as you can see, there were very, very few real improvements in the iron other than how it was heated. Now, let's go on to something. This is not exactly an iron, but it's an iron-related accessory. This is a sprinkling bottle. And yes, unfortunately, most of these sprinkling bottles were in the shape of little Chinese people. Yes, very racist. What can I say? This, however, is extremely typical of the pieces you will see as sprinkling bottles. Now, the key to the bottle was this top. And this, in this case, this is an aluminum top, and it has a cork sleeve, and you take that, and you just pop it in a bottle, and you can turn any bottle into a sprinkler. Now, these cork sprinkling tops, uh, I grabbed that picture from Amazon. These are currently available. You can go to Amazon, you can buy them. Um, I didn't price them out for you, because obviously I'm not advocating Amazon products over genuine vintage anything. So here you go. I did price this one out for you. I saw this on eBay. It's about $20 and $5 shipping. As you can see, 15 cents originally. And this is a laundry sprinkler top, as the card says. And here you go. This is what I would say probably 99.7% of sprinkling bottles looked like. People would go out, get the little sprinkler top, and use any bottle they happen to have on hand. That's just what they did. Now, personally, if I were doing a mid-century kitchen, I would absolutely get one of those brightly colored stoppers, and I might well get one from Amazon simply because it would have the advantage of having new cork. And I would get a nice vintage 1950s Pepsi bottle. And there you go. That would be my vintage 
50s accessory for my laundry center. And speaking of 50s, this iron is probably from the 1940s and not the 1950s. But this is what an iron looked like in the mid-century. And as you can see, very little in the way of changes from this to our first electrified model. And frankly, I just don't see that much in the way of changes between this and the brand new iron I have in my laundry cabinet. Here's another earlier model. This is the 30s. And look, we have Mary Potts's double fronted design. So you can take that iron, you can push it forward, you can push it backward. It's going to work either way. Unfortunately, that, that is a, a style innovation that never really caught on. It seemed to be effective at the time, but we don't see irons like that today. So I would have to say, it's unfortunate because it was a very good idea. And I personally, when I am ironing, almost every time I pick up my iron, there is some point in that ironing project where I want to push the iron in the opposite direction and I can't. So I'm sorry, Mary. I really wish your idea had taken off better. This is a style of iron I wanted you to see, because even though this looks like a 1930s iron, this style is called a travel iron or portable iron, and they are designed to be packed in suitcases. They're small, but because it's a special purpose iron and it has a special configuration, I wanted you to see it. You can usually spot a travel iron by this handle configuration. It's an open-ended handle. So these irons have not changed. Since they first came out, a modern travel iron is going to look just like this one. And I believe this one is from the early 60s. And while we are looking at special purpose irons, this is gas iron. People will see this and say, what in the world does that mean? Is this a steam iron? No, it's a gas iron. And in fact, here, let me show you this. This is a vintage Coleman gas iron. Current Coleman gas irons look very much like this. And it's a camping iron. I, I know, you're probably saying to yourself, good Lord, you go camping to get away from the ironing. What's wrong with this picture? I know, I know. I guess there are just some people who have a very different idea of roughing it out in the woods. But Coleman still makes irons like this. This also is a special purpose iron. This is a presser. I would call it a creaser, but in fact it's called a presser. You take a pair of pants, you slide the creased end in between those two plates, and then just run it down to get yourself a perfect crease down the front of your pants. Uh, and that, by the way, was a huge, huge deal back in the mid-century. I recall my mother had these special metal frames that she would slip into my father's pants and hang them out to dry that way, and they would create a perfect press in the pants with that crease while they dried on the clothesline. It was bizarre, but believe me, people took their ironing very seriously in those days. And here we go. Now, this is the sort of thing that would make me take my iron very seriously. This is a 1941 Ed Milton Ed Milton Petty Point Iron. This is gorgeous. This is just fabulous. Streamlined, modern styling. This is so yummy. Here's another picture. Beautiful. This one has a brown Bakelite handle. That 
is a gorgeous iron. And, you know, I look at something like this and I say, oh, what happened to us? We hit a point in the early 1940s. And for heaven's sake, that was like 80 years ago. And that's when iron styling peaked. Why didn't we take this ball and run with it a little? Imagine what irons would look like if we took designing irons seriously. Well, anyway, this is gorgeous, and I did want to share it with you. Now, this is an iron from the 1960s, I believe, very early 60s. This is what an iron looked like right through until the, the 80s. Um, actually, beyond that, because I can recall seeing irons in the stores in the 1990s and early 2000s that still looked very much like this. This is where the style sort of landed. Um, our major technological change was the addition of water to the iron to create steam. And that, in now this is a steam iron, as you can see. Stylistically, it's very little difference, uh, there's very little difference between this iron and the two we just saw, but this one does have the technological improvement of steam. And then, of course, we have this, and this is what irons began to look like in, I would say, probably the late 70s, early 80s. This style started to be seen out in the stores. The advantage to this style is you can actually see the water level in the iron. Other than that, I'm just not seeing a lot of advantage to the style like this. This is very close to where we are now. Let me show you this. This is a brand new iron. I simply went online and said, show me high-end irons, and this is what I got. So if you take a look at the side-by-side -side pictures, a very old iron, something that would have been used in oh, let's say the early 1800s, and something that you would use today. That, that looks a lot like my iron. Stylistically, there have been very few changes. We are still looking at the same device that was used in medieval times. We have different sources of fuel, and that's about it. So, there you go. A brief history of pressing clothes. I know, you're all sitting back saying, oh yes, pressing clothes is my favorite, favorite job. I'm so glad I know how it's done. Well, the truth is, the reason pressing clothes is probably your least favorite job is because you're pretty much doing it the same way that some medieval serf laundress did it eight or nine hundred years ago. The only difference is your iron runs on electricity and you have steam coming out of your iron. Frankly, I don't even have that difference. Because when I iron my sheets, my sheets are the biggest ironing headache I have. I let them go in the dryer until they are about three quarters dry and they are still damp when I take them out and press them. So quite frankly, other than the fuel source, I could be using great, 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 great grandma's iron. One of the reasons this is such a uh, job of drudgery is because we haven't changed the way we do it. So I will let you chew on that for a while and 
We're going to take a look at a slideshow on the way out. I will see you all tomorrow. In the meantime, have a terrific day. Thank you.